Structural engineers are the analytical experts who design everyday structures like high-rises, bridges, and houses. But what exactly is the role of a structural engineer? What does their design process really look like? How do they design structures that can withstand huge earthquakes and crazy storms? And how do they work with architects and builders to turn someone's dreams into a reality? Well, these are just some of the questions I'm going to be answering in this video because today I'm going to be going through the four stages that a structural engineer goes through in order to bring a residential house to life. Also, if you're new here, my name is Ben and I'm a structural engineer working and living on the east coast of Australia. And if you find value in this video, please do give it a like and consider subscribing. All right, so before a structural engineer even gets involved on a residential house project, typically there are three things that have already happened. Number one is that someone has purchased a piece of land and and they've decided that they want to build a new house. Number two is that the client has engaged an architect and the architect has produced a set of drawings which captures exactly what the client is wanting to have built. And number three is that a geotechnical engineer has been out to this piece of land and conducted a series of ground investigations and ultimately produced a soil report. In the soil report there's information on things like the soil type, composition and strength and the structural engineers will need all this information when they design the footing system. All right now after after these three things have happened, the client basically has an idea, a drawing of that idea and a soil report. But to go any further, this is where the structural engineer will need to get involved because it'll be their job to figure out how we can turn this idea and drawings into a strong and buildable structure. So for the structural engineers, this is where the preliminary design stage begins. During the preliminary design stage, our main goals are to figure out things like which structural elements we're actually going to need, how these different structural elements are all going to be laid out, and also to start to think about how we're going to connect each one of these elements. For a residential house, this means we need to work things out like which direction will the roof trusses span, which walls will need to be load bearing, and also what type and size the footings need to be. Structural engineers typically start their design from the top of the structure and work their way down and as they do this they create a series of drawings. This series of drawings will then be annotated in more detail during the analysis stage. For example the first drawing that they will create will be a roof framing plan. This plan will outline things like the assumed truss layout, what walls will be load bearing and also any lintels over openings. After this and for a two-story house they would then create a floor framing plan. On this drawing they would begin by overlaying the load bearing walls from the roof above and figuring out which way the floor joists need to span to pick up these load bearing walls. After this, they would then figure out which walls need to be load bearing under these floor joists. Now, once these two framing plans have been figured out, there's only really two more plans that we need to do, and they are the slab plan and the footing plan. Using the information that's in the soil report, this is where the structural engineer will need to make a decision and figure out what sort of slab and footing system the house will need. If the soil report shows that the site has low soil reactivity and that it has a decent allowable bearing pressure close to the surface, often the slab system will be a stiff and rough slab or a waffle pod slab. On the other hand, if the soil report shows a layer of crappy soil near the surface, often the stiff and raft slab or waffle pod slab will need to sit on a series of board piers or even screw piers. Either way, the structural engineer will need to do a markup of where the ground beams will need to go and also indicate the positions of any board piers or screw piers. Once the structural engineer has completed this preliminary set of plans, it's then time to move on to the analysis stage. Okay, so during the analysis stage, there's basically two goals. Goal number one is to determine all the loads that the structure is going to experience. And goal number two is to get specific about how large each structural member needs to be and also about how each structural element is going to be connected. Starting with goal number one, there's basically two types of loads that we need to estimate and they are vertical loads and horizontal loads. Starting with the vertical loads, simply put, they are the loads that act downwards. So this consists of things like the weight of the structure itself, construction materials, the furniture and equipment inside, and also the different live load allowances we make in different areas of the house. For example, within a house, we account for a certain amount of loading in general areas like a bathroom or a living room, but then we account for a higher amount of loading in places like a balcony or a deck. Once we've figured out how big these loads are and where they're gonna be acting, we then need to design a roof system and a floor system. For a floor system within a house, this would typically be in the form of plywood laid on top of timber floor joists and bed Errors, but it can also be in the form of a concrete slab reinforced with steel bars. Typically the type of floor system has already been specified by the architect so this won't be a decision that the structural engineer has to make but it will be something that the structural engineer will need to analyze and specify. From here the floor system in the house
tasks will then transfer these loads onto the next part of the structural system, which is the columns and the walls. Now, the types of columns and walls that you need will depend on the type of floor system that you have. So this will either be a combination of steel columns and timber stub frame walls or reinforced block work walls. Columns and walls are arguably one of the most important structural elements in any house as they're the thing that's holding the floor up and technically the entire building. So if they were to fail, the entire building would come down with it. And besides that, they're also responsible for transferring the building loads onto the next part of the structural system, which is the footings. Once the building loads have been transferred through the walls into the footings, the footings then transfer these loads onto the soil. By completing this load path and making sure that all the loads get down and into the soil, this is how we know that the building won't fail under vertical loads. But that's not the end of the story because we also need to account for horizontal loads. Now, unlike vertical loads, which are applying a downward force on a structure and trying to make it fail in that direction, Horizontal forces from winds and earthquakes are trying to push the building over. Structural engineers can find out how large these horizontal forces are expected to be by reading national codes and standards, which have formulas and equations for calculating how big these forces are based off research and data that's been captured in the area that you're designing for. Now, columns themselves aren't very good at resisting horizontal loads, so we do need another structural system in our house in order to resist these forces, and they are often in the form of braces or reinforced walls. In everyday homes, to manage these horizontal forces, we often use things such as plywood bracing, strap bracing, and power trusses. These braced walls basically act as a really stiff cantilever member, and by distributing them evenly throughout a house in both directions, we're able to get these horizontal forces down and into the footings. Now, a couple of questions you might still be wondering is how do structural engineers know how to do all this, and how do they actually do their analysis? Well, how structural engineers know how to do this is by using their expertise in engineering mechanics, analysis, and material properties that they've learnt while they're at university, and also through many years of experience. In regards to how we actually go about doing this, we often use a combination of things like mathematical formulas, spreadsheets, design programs, and also structural analysis models. For example, when analyzing concrete structures, we will often use finite element analysis programs that allow us to model plate elements. This is so we can easily see which areas are highly stressed and can pay special attention in those areas and make sure our design has got enough reinforcement. There's really no rules on how a structural engineer must analyze and design a structure, so it's really going to vary depending from engineer to engineer, although the underlying principles obviously remain the same. Alright, now after the design process is complete, we then move on to the next stage which is drawings. Currently the engineers have their designs within their calculation pads, their software programs and some preliminary markups but they can't just give those to the builder and expect them to know what to do. So this is where they'll need to nicely illustrate their final design onto paper. Within structural engineering companies, there's usually a whole drafting team whose job it is is to create these structural engineering drawings. And how this usually works is that the structural engineer will give a set of markups to the drafting team, and it'll be their job to make this nice and neat and ready for construction. The types of things that are included on these drawings are things like the structural element layout, details around how things are connected, and any other pieces of information which will make the structure buildable and safe. Okay, and next we have the construction stage. At this point, the structural drawings have been checked, reviewed, and finalized, so things on site can get started. Now, structural engineers don't actually build or get hands-on during the construction process. Those people are the builders or contractors, but they do play a big role throughout construction. At regular intervals, they will need to conduct site inspections and make sure that things are being built as per their design, and they will also need to be available to answer questions from the builder about their design. Also, throughout the construction process, things often change or mistakes happen, and in these situations, the structural engineer will also need to provide a solution. For example, the builder might decide that he wants to put the roof rafters at 900 centers instead of 600 centers, and when he does this, he wants to use a bigger roof raft and because of this, the structural engineer will then need to check that this is okay and still works structurally. In a perfect world, builders wouldn't be making changes like this because it does mean that we have more work to do as structural engineers, but this does happen and we do just have to roll with it. Anyways, I hope that you learned something in this video and if you did enjoy it, you might like this video here where I take you through a day in the life of a structural engineer or that video there where I share the most important topics to learn in structural engineering. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.